Turn around at the corner. What about Move around on the corner a little bit so y'all can have some. There you go. Very good. <laughs> okay. Welcome all. Uh, have a work session on uh, of October 11th, uh, 2011. First item on the work session. There's two items tonight. First is the discussion of the 911 center, and the second is uh, issue on uh, I guess it's rating of transportation projects for the city of Pocosin. But uh, we'll start back with the discussion of the 911 center and. Chief, are you talking first? Or? Just briefly, uh, okay. we've asked uh, Terry Hall, who's the uh, 911 manager for the York, Picos, and Williamsburg 911 Center, the regional center which we are a part of and have been a part of since uh, the fall of 2007. <coughs> and uh, one of the reasons we wanted to give you a brief update to let you know how that's working out as, as part of our uh, participation and to give you an idea of uh, <clears throat> how the uh, management and the operation of that center works with uh, Chief Holloway and my participation on the governance board. So uh, we've asked Terry to come in. He's prepared a short PowerPoint and will be prepared to answer questions after he's done. So we thank you for your attention tonight and the opportunity to bring you up to date. Terry? Okay. Thanks, uh, Chief, and thank you all for the opportunity. Uh, it's kind of interesting that I get to come here and report to a couple of my bosses sitting next to me. I'm used to seeing them in a little more closed environment and talking at, you know, 12 o'clock at night, 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, well, I'm here to talk about the York, Picos, and Williamsburg uh, Emergency Communication Center. You can see by the picture on the board, we have uh, completed our expansion of the facility. Uh, we basically have uh, 15 911 consoles that are in there now, and uh, that's a very current picture that was taken this morning, as a matter of fact, of the communications facility, and, and uh, you can see the staffing that we have in there. wanted to talk a little bit about the chain of command that we have. Uh, although it's a regional consolidation, the York County Board of Supervisors is who, who actually runs the center through the county administrator. I report a direct report to James McReynolds, the county administrator there, and then uh, under that we have numerous other positions. We have the communications coordinator, which basically serves as my uh, deputy director. We're going through a, a, a national accreditation called CALEA and we have an accreditation manager, which was the director of the Williamsburg Center when we consolidated them. We put them in. They were clearly a certified uh, operation, so we thought that it was very beneficial for us to, to bring them in as well. Uh, we have an administrative assistant. We have someone that maintains our uh, NCIC and VSIN. That's the FBI records and the Virginia State Police records because we keep the warrants and issue all the paperwork, and with all the uh, frequent law changes that we have, as an example, if, if uh, a police officer responds to a domestic, we have what's called an EPO, an emergency protective order. That takes someone about 30 minutes to fill out. Uh, they have to fill it out, enter it into NCIC VSIN. Uh, that way, if a police officer has another run-in with that person, uh, they go to jail on the second offense. So the records are very detailed. Uh, keeping the records are so detailed that if we don't keep them correctly, it could result in... Uh, someone being falsely arrested or arrested again for the same crime that our KPS that we already had. So very detailed work. We also have a CAD computer-aided dispatch administrator, and then we have four shifts of dis uh, dispatchers. Each one of the shifts is made up of eight to ten dispatchers, and our minimum staffing that we have on duty at a time is, is eight. Uh, and the way that's broken down is we have two dispatchers for Pocosum, one for Pocosin Fire, one for Pocosin Police. We have two dispatchers for the city of Williamsburg, one for Williamsburg PD and one for Williamsburg Fire, and two for York County, one for York County Sheriff's Office and one for York County Fire. And then we have two people that are call takers. Now what's interesting about this is all of them are cross-trained. So you never get the same person when you call in. You, don't, you no longer have two Pocosin dispatchers and two Williamsburg dispatchers. They log in, they sign in on their computer, and they become whatever dispatcher they are. So one day they may be dispatching Pocos, and the next day York County, and so on. That has proved to help us out enormously. Uh, with mutual aid calls, being able to dispatch everyone out of the same jurisdiction sa shaves a lot of minutes off the call. Um, I'll also point out that all of, uh, all of the positions that's under me uh, every one of the people in these administrative positions and uh, training coordinators and so on, they're also cross-trained as dispatchers. So we stand them up in times of emergencies, and uh, many of these people have been down here working. When we have the seafood festival, we put extra staff on. When they're DUI and checking details at the 
that the uh, Chief Bowen has. We assign extra staff to that. And when you staff your EOC, those of you that came through the EOC uh, during the hurricanes and such, we actually put staff down here 24 hours a day, too, on an as-needed basis. The dotted line that comes across it talks about our governance board because I report administratively to the county administrator, but I actually work for this governance board. And the governance board is made up by Chief Bowen, you know, seated to my right here, and Chief Holloway. And they're on the board. We meet quarterly and on as-needed basis. Uh, I can tell you that I really can't think of a week, uh, let alone a few days, that we're not in some form of communication via telephone, text, or email about different events that are happening and so on. Uh, we also work for the police chief, and or I also report to the police chief in Williamsburg, the fire chief in Williamsburg, the York County fire chief, and uh, Danny Diggs asked me to make sure that I pointed out that it's the York Pocosin sheriff. So he said, in reality, you know, always a politician. You have two and a half votes there. <laughs> so, uh, so with the Sheriff Diggs in there, you know, he, he's in the mix as well. Uh, since the conception of this, I can think of zero controversial issues that we've had with anything. The things that, uh, that we bring to the board are similar to what we're doing here. We make group decisions on the equipment we're purchasing our short and long-term strategic plan. When we have administrative issues, you know, uh, suspensions, uh, firings, any of that, I always vet that off members of the board. And uh, even though we're using our own HR resources, I think it's important for the bosses to understand what's going on in the organization. Well, this, uh, what we did is we put together some statistics for tonight uh, on FY 2011. That, uh, and we processed over 288,000 calls for service in there. We have emergency phone calls. We had over 56,000 911 calls that we answered in the communication center. Our total calls for service that we dispatched. Now, a call for service is actually something that we originated, we generated. It does not include a police officer out doing a traffic stop or any officer initiated. It also doesn't include the fire inspections or any of the other uh, um, activities that they conduct within fire services. These are actually calls where we pick up the, the radio and we dispatch you out to an event. And Pocosin calls for service uh, on FY 2011 <clears throat> was 13,787. Law enforcement was 11,900. Fire was 1,725. And animal control was 162. Um, Pocosin's average monthly and again, this is an average of 1,149, and then Pocosian's average daily is 38.3 calls. Now, that's where we send someone out. That's not a police officer doing a traffic stop. That's not the fire department out doing the routine things that they do. That's where we receive a complaint or a call, and we dispatch someone to a resident or to an event. And uh, I can tell you that some days they're well over 100 and some days they're around 15 or 20. It depends on the nature of the beast and uh, weather conditions and you know different events and so on. <clears throat> a little bit about our staffing. The console that you see before you is a typical 911 screen. Uh, the screen to the right is actually our radio system. The screen in the middle is the computer-aided dispatch. Uh, and the screen to a second from the left is actually the 911 screen where the calls come into the dispatcher, and then the one on the left is our mapping component. <clears throat> so one of the things that was lacking when we when we brought in was a very robust mapping component so that we could locate people when they dial 911 coming out of Pocosin. All of that has been updated. I can tell you that we have numerous success stories about cell calls coming in here, not only in here but out from boats, people being rescued out on the water and so on. And our map, mapping components not only plot where they're at in the water, it tells us our closest boat landing where we can recommend dispatches to the fire department and to law enforcement. We have uh, 29 dispatchers. We have six senior dispatchers, and that means that they've gone through uh, a large period of training and they're seasoned and, and they've met certain criteria. And then we have four shift leaders. This is important because 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, we have someone that is a supervisor that's on duty. So any time that a citizen would run into a problem, any time that our, our first responders would have an issue, we always have a shift leader there 
that is able to address anything that would come up, and they have a direct link to, uh, to other management. I can tell you that the two chiefs sitting to my right have received calls in the middle of the night over various events and uh, will continue to do so. <clears throat> but they have been trained on what they need to call and wake up everyone to know about, and uh, I'm unaware of us ever placing a call that has jammed anyone up from that. We also have administra uh, administrative staff, which is myself. I have a deputy chief. We have a CLIA accreditation manager. She also handles a lot of the projects. We have an enormous amount of projects going on currently. We have an administrative assistant that takes care of not only the payroll and the, and the budget type of issues, but pays all the bills and you know keeps us all straight that way. We have a training coordinator. When you have a, a group of 50 employees, uh, the training to, that you have to keep up, you need a full-time training officer to do it. Uh, every six months, we get a Department of Criminal Justice standards changes the, the type of training that we need to do. Uh, we have our latest uh, event that has come out now, it looks like we're going to have to spend $150,000 from an unfunded mandate coming from the Virginia State Police and the FBI so that anyone that works a terminal to run license plates and so on, that they can no longer just use a password. We have to put in either a, a retina scan, a thumbprint, or some type of key fob. And they've given us a year and a half to come up with the money uh, to do that. So that's something that we inherit from the, from the state and the FBI as well. We have a CAT administrator. Uh, the CAT administrator takes care of all of our run responses, and you're going to see in a minute a couple, of the, a couple of the programs that we've come up for CAT administrator. We also have a VSYNC coordinator uh, working with three agencies and being responsible for all the warrants and all the detail. The VSYNC coordinator cross-checks every piece of paper that goes through there where we've made an arrest or we take out a warrant, uh, and we are audited twice a year. And uh, the audits, we have been phenomenal and have scored very high and have received letters of accommodation from the state police about how well our records are kept. So we're very proud of that. And then again, all of the administrative, administrative staff are all certified as dispatchers. It's interesting, uh, we had a 911 board meeting going on up there, and one of the dispatchers uh, had an issue with, uh, uh, with health. And, uh, you know, we hear the alert tone go out, and there's an alert tone that just says, anybody that's in the building coming to the center, we've got a problem. And uh, so I'm in here with all of these first responders, you know, chiefs and everything, and we've got a dispatcher laid out on the floor that they say is not breathing. So it's kind of like going to a convention where it's, hey, doctor, 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 you've got like seven people kneeling to get ready to administer CPR to somebody that opens their eyes and says, what are you people doing? So... <laughs> Uh, our 911 shift schedules, we have four teams or four shifts of people. They come in and they work 12-hour shifts. They work from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, all of their breaks are taken at their consoles. Uh, so they go into the kitchen. They can fix food, but they don't eat in the kitchen. They eat at their consoles. And this appears to be uh, what works out nationwide. By the way, uh, anyone want to take a guess what the number one reason that dispatchers leave their job for? There's a 25% turnover rate every five years nationally, and 97% of the people that start work as a dispatcher will never retire. And the number one reason they leave isn't pay and stress. It's for lack of tools to do their job. The people that do this for profession care about what they do. They're professionals, and they want to utilize the tools to be able to orchestrate what's going on with the first response. They're the first of the first responders. Nothing starts and nothing stops without them being involved. Uh, On-duty staffing is a minimum of eight. We staff up. As an example, when the hurricane was going on, not only did we have dispatchers down here at the EOCs and, and in Williamsburg at the EOCs, we had an additional eight people on staff at the center. Uh, Y'all remember when the earthquake happened, the earthquake froze up the cellular networks. Well, everybody that was on the cellular networks, it seemed like half of them were calling 911. The other half was calling somebody to say, did you feel that? Well, the ones that were able to connect with us, we were processing over 50 calls every two and a half to three minutes. So it was a very, a very tedious process, and then we were followed by the hurricane. And I can tell you how to get the phone ringing. It sent out, a, sent out a code red saying, we have a mandatory evacuation, and everybody calls <laughs> us to want to know what it is on, on 911. So, you know, we're there 24 hours a day, and we respond 
uh, to the emergencies as they happen. And again, our minimum staffing is eight. Most of the time that we have 10, we typically are always uh, have some people training, but the minimum is eight release full-time dispatchers. A little bit about our training because it's no longer uh, back in the day when, uh, when all of us were a lot younger, you know, you'd have a police officer get hurt or a firefighter get hurt, you put them in the radio room, as they say, and they'd answer the radio or the telephone. Now they have to be state-mandated, Department of Criminal Justice certified, and they have a two-week training period that they have to go through at the Regional Academy of Criminal Justice. We also have a bare minimum in-house training that takes about three weeks for them to do. And on that one, they go through just how to operate 911, which is a computer, how to operate the computer-aided dispatch, which is where we dump all the 911 calls that keeps all the records and tells us who to send on a response, and also how to operate the state police um, computer network that ties <coughs> us into uh, what's called VSIN. Uh, one of the programs that we won an award for several years ago that we use drug asset for, for, forfeiture money to pay for, <coughs> we do something that's called a cash grade inquiry. We're the first ones to do that. And what happens if a police officer marks out on a traffic stop, when he runs a license plate, our computers take over, and we not only run that license plate, we run it through NCIC, which is the FBI, VSEN, which is a state. We also run the two registered owners and check their status. So by doing that, it gives, the, it gives the police officer a heads up before they step out of the vehicle that the subject has previous arrest warrants, he's wanted, or they have a criminal history, they have a concealed weapons permit, and so on. We utilize that today, and it's caught on, and it's very effective. We also have on-the-job training before someone's released. The quickest anyone is released to be a full-time dispatcher is six months. The maximum we'll keep on that way is 12 months, so it takes six to 12 months to train someone. Our emergency medical dispatching that we have is a 40-hour class. Uh, I have a slide on that in a few minutes, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And then we have recertifications that we have to do, not only for EMD, but DCJS and all the other programs that we dispatch. And then we've also applied for and received uh, regionally. We're part of a couple hundred thousand dollar grant by which we train <coughs> dispatchers with uh, Portsmouth, Chesapeake, Virginia Beach, Norfolk, James City County, et cetera. And then we're going through the uh, Communications Assistant for Law Enforcement Act for CLIA to become a CLIA certified, and that's the top 2% of the communication centers in the country. So we received a grant, and again, there's something that we like to use in our regional center. It's called OPM. That stands for Other People's Money. So anytime <laughs> that we can get OPM, we like that word. So. Uh, we needed to get a new EMD program, so they had a matching fund grant. We went out and received $40,000 to, to launch that. And we just launched our APCO meds program, and our APCO meds has to be approved by our operational medical director, which is out of Riverside Hospital, and then we have a 40-hour mandated class, and then we research every two years. We have also automated our EMD program, and it is now on our CAD system, or will be on the new CAD system, so that any time someone would receive the call of a cardiac or respiratory arrest, it flashes right in front of them. They no longer pick up a card. It flashes right in front of them, the protocols that they utilize. There's literally not one day in our communication center that we do not take a call and give, uh, give medical instructions. Uh, after we had gone through uh, the process of our consolidation, I had the, the privilege and honor of calling Chief Holloway on Thanksgiving Day. And I uh, called him at Thanksgiving Day, and he said, Happy Thanksgiving. I said, Happy Thanksgiving to you. I said, I'm calling with some good news. We just had a code blue, which was a cardiac respiratory arrest in the city of Pocosin. A dispatcher gave medical instructions over the phone. Fire department arrived on scene. CPR subject was in full arrest. <coughs> CPR was administered by the dispatcher, taken over by the first responders, and the subject went to the hospital alive and later came home. So the chief and I, you know, shared a Thanksgiving thought there that everything that we had gone through to that point paid off. And that success story, you know, continues to, to lead us. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we had done is we just went through this. On June the 27th, we implemented our new EMD protocol. On June the 29th, one of our dispatchers took a call, Tracy King. You may recognize that name. She used to work here in Pocosin several years ago. Tracy took a call right after the new EMD protocols. And what's interesting, you know, we used to do the breathing and the chest compressions. 
and then the breathing and the chest compressions. The first uh, conversion we had with the 100 chest compressions, which is the new EMD protocol, was a lady that dialed, or a young lady, 15 years old, dialed 911, said her mom was, they were moving out of a house. She grabbed her chest and fell over and she was dead. She wasn't breathing. Tracy very calmly got the child calmed down enough. They did 100 compressions, a couple of breaths, and kept this up until the sheriff's department arrived, followed by the medics. Two months later, two months later, I received a phone call from a lady that lives right down here in Running Man and said, I just want to tell you the reason I'm calling you is I'm going home from the hospital and my cardiologist has told me I had a rare event and you can use my name and my picture anywhere, but the reason I'm calling is because your crew saved my life and my cardiologist said the only reason I'm talking to you today is early intervention of CPR. So this is a tried and proven program and it was one of the big benefits of y'all joining our system. And I could go on and on with that, but y'all get the point of how much it works. We're also working on, uh, you know, a, a million four worth of grants that we got. Uh, I put Sheriff Diggs up there because, again, I vetted this off of him and him being the politician that he is. He said, make sure you tell him I'm on the wireless board. <laughs> <laughs> Sheriff Diggs uh, received a... Uh, uh, governor's appointment to the state wireless board. <clears throat> so he's actually on the state wireless board that helps us sign these grants. So that's a good move for us and it helps us out a lot here in, in, in Hampton Road as well. We also receive scholarship grants, $2,000 per conference to send dispatchers to conference that our staff has gone out and been able to get. And we also uh, applied for and received $15,000 uh, before the next hurricane comes in here, knock on wood, we have uh, received a grant and we're going to be putting a uh, base station and a couple of ready remotes in your EOC because one of the things was lacking was a way for us to have communications out of here in times of disaster. So we've applied for that and received that, and that will be going in very shortly. And Chief Holloway uh, has just received a secondary grant uh, that he has staff working on that will further enhance us and provide some more field units as well. Uh, awards, we received the Governor's Award for Excellence in Technology. Uh, they give out one of those awards, and we won it last year, so we're very proud of that. We also won uh, uh, AED award uh, for AED, uh, Automatic External Defibrillator. Uh, I'm going to claim that I stole this because I didn't make this up, but I was at another uh, communication center on the West Coast and found out that someone had taken and located all of the public buildings where everywhere they had an AED they put in the CAD system. And then they tied it to their CAD system, so if they had someone in cardiac or respiratory arrest, they could be directed to where the closest AED unit was. So uh, we put that into our, our CAD system and applied for a, a NACO award and received that. We also received an award. We were the first communication center in the country to take calls from what's called the external alarm. That's the ADT and the Honeywells. Uh, if you have a call that would come in from your house, you have a fire alarm, an intrusion alarm, it could take 12 minutes before we would receive it in the 911 center. We did a prototype that's now been accepted as a standard across the country, and uh, we've narrowed that down to less than three minutes now. So we can have emergencies that happen in-house, and we've launched with Vector Security, and it's now been launched in Richmond, Virginia, and Houston, Texas. So it's now a standard, and it's under development. <clears throat> And we also received a program for Heads Up. And one of the things that was beneficial to us during, uh, during hurricanes and such is we can print out our Heads Up form, which we've added many people from Pocosin, and tell about pre-existing conditions that exist at someone's residence. They're confined to wheelchair, they're power dependent, and so on. We can provide those forms to emergency management <coughs> through Chief Holloway. And if they need to go out and check on someone, those that have registered for the program uh, are able to be checked on. The current projects that were underway, I have my five-minute warning. Uh, current projects that are underway, we're going to be and have entered into an agreement with a company called TCS, and we're launching the first next-generation 911 project in the country. We're going to be taking text messages from Verizon Wireless and taking text messages and being able to get locations <coughs> of text messages. It's a pilot program that will take about a year. Uh, initial costs were over $3 million. We have received a grant from the state of Virginia, and they're gonna, they've partnered with us, and it's going to be paid for 100% by the Commonwealth, and this will set the trend to the way that our technology is developed. We did the same thing with our wireless location technology, so we're very excited about this. 
negotiated a special price and, and have received funding from the state to be able to do it. We'll take it to our board in uh, December. Uh, our new CAD system, we have just purchased a new computer-aided dispatch system to replace the other one. Uh, one of the things that we talked to city council about is the need. You no longer buy a radio system. You no longer buy a computer system or telephone system that's going to last you 10 years. They're all computer-based, so you have to do a hardware <laughs> refresh every three to five years. Uh, the CAD system that we have now is seven years old. We're in the process of updating our CAD system, and that's underway. We've done several mapping enhancements. The map that you see in front is one that we've done for the city of Pocosin. We've taken Pocosin's maps, and on this one it actually shows fire hydrant locations. We also can pinpoint where the uh, automatic external defibrillators are. We also, uh, those of you that heard about the child that was abducted and molested in Florida and buried alive in the backyard of the trailer, <clears throat> one of the things that one of my staff uh, found out through the media was that the police department knew that that person was a sexual offender, but they had no way to tie it to. So we've listed all the sex offenders in the three jurisdictions, and any time we would have a missing child, the sex offenders would pop up on a map layer, and we could say where they live. Not that they're going to be profiled, but it's sure no, good to know when you're out doing an investigation somewhere that you may want to start taking a look at. And we also have listed where all the fire hydrants are. This is another thing we're real proud of. We're also in the process of installing a brand new 911 system. And we have a total redundant center. When, when you all brought into this, you not only brought into uh, York, Pecos, and Williamsburg, but James City County is a sister center. It's a hot center, meaning that it's up and operational 24 hours a day, and they provide us back up and we them. Our centers are built so that we can answer each other's calls. When we started looking in, in York, James City, uh, and Pecos, and Williamsburg about our new 911 system, we needed redundancy. What you're seeing there is a 911 system that was proposed to York, Pecos, and Williamsburg. So <clears> what we did is we actually split that system and put half of it up in James City County, half of it down here, tied it together over our own microwave network. Now, all that sounds fancy, but what it means in plain language, if we're extremely busy and our call volume gets where the call rings seven or eight times, call number seven or eight is going to be answered in James City County and they're going to enter the information in CAD just like they were right where we are and vice versa. This is a no-cost option. It costs no one a dime to do this, and it gives us 100% redundancy, but yet we still maintain our independence. So we have a total hot 911 center in James City County that in the last several years we, we've used it numerous times. Goals that we've achieved that we had set out to do, we provide an enhanced level of service for the first responders. You know. Uh, after we got over the, the shock of doing the consolidation and split, you know, there's none of this, oh, this is Pocos and this is York, this is Williamsburg. And the people call in from the field, the first responders were all one large team. The merger has provided an enhanced level of service to the citizens and visitors of Pocosin. We've implemented an EMD program that provides a, uh, a superior level of excellence. Our mapping in phase two location, which was a big problem we had down here, has been fixed 100%. And Pocosin is also going to acquire the benefits of all, all of our emerging technologies as we look at ne next generation. If you look at the children that are in schools and the ones that carry cell phones, and, you know, we had an event right here in Running Man, a uh, 13-year-old girl called 911 and said, look, I'm seeing someone breaking into a residence here. The dispatcher says, where are you at? Lady knew ex the young lady knew exactly where her dress was. She gave it to us. She says, I'm looking out here, and let me give you a description of the car. Well, when people are upset, they don't always give the best descriptions. You know what she did? She said, hold on a minute, and I'll send you a picture. She snapped the picture with her cell phone, and the dispatcher said, well, that's great, but we have no way to receive the picture. Now, isn't that, remember, dispatchers leave for lack of tools. So a quick-thinking dispatcher ran out to her locker and grabbed her cell phone, which are prohibited in the communication center, and said, here's where you send it to, had it sent to her personal phone. She looked at it, was able to enhance it, got the license plate, gave it to the law enforcement, which on this particular case was a York County unit and a Pocosin unit running on mutual aid. They went in and stopped the vehicle three blocks from it. The, the two ladies that were picked up in it, I think, ended up with six felony warrants from three different agencies. And technology is, is who caught that person. So with that, that's pretty much, you know, what I've prepared to say tonight and be happy any of the three of us to answer any questions or if you all have any comments you want to add. Well, let me start by, Terry, you, 
we can tell that you know this is uh, your love. I, I can tell you, there's there's uh, a lot of us that were here when we went and joined the York Percussion uh, Williamsburg 911 Center that were thinking, well, you know, looking only at ourselves, that we could do this, you know, and. Your presentation tonight has brought home to, I think, all of us that we did the right thing uh, by getting into a regional uh, consortium that can do more than we can do by ourselves. And that's really the power of regionalism. And I'll tell you, the, the second thing is, everywhere I go, uh, Terry, they speak very highly of you, you as far as bringing your, the technology where it needs to be and never sitting on your laurels and just keep going with the next thing. What's next? What's next? You have a lot to be proud of, and it'd be very easy to sit back and go, we're doing it just fine. We're doing just a great job. But what I'm seeing is that you're pushing the envelope further than it ever has, and I can see from the success stories that we're glad to be a part of the E911 with you at its head. And I'm sure that the two chiefs here can uh, tell me a thousand other stories, and I think they've shared some of them with me. But thank you so much for what you do, and thank you from the citizens of Pocosin and the city council. Does anybody got any questions? The only one I had, Terry, and it, it caught me the Heads Up program. Can you tell, you know, right here in public, you know, so we can capture it, how you get registered for that? Sure. We've got several ways. One is you can go to the website, to the Fire and Life Safety website for York County and download one. You can go to the York County Internet site. But the best way to do it is call 890-3621, 890-3621. And that's a non-emergency number into the PSAP uh, to the Public Safety Answering Point, the 911 Center, and tell the dispatcher that you want a heads-up form. We'll send it to you in mail or we'll send it to you electronic, whatever you want to do. It takes about 15 minutes to fill out, and uh, it, it, not only, it, it not only takes care of medical events. We have officer safety things that we put in there. We have heads-up information in there, someone who stores chemicals. It's very important to the fire chief here to know that someone's got a hazmat material or where the, where the, paint, uh, where the <coughs> auto dealership stores their paints when they're in there fighting a the fire. So we're able to give that information to them before they get on scene to give them the heads-up. And we keep copies of the form at the police station as well. We keep them at the And we have also break. have attended a couple of civic, uh, <coughs> civic events down here, and we always send our staff out with heads-up forms too. Okay. Thank you very much. Do they have to be oh, updated? What we do, and that's a very good point, uh, we do update them ourselves, and the only downside about the program, uh, when we were a smaller agency, it was a little easier because you remember someone was in heads up and you find out that they pass, and then you, you know, you're calling them six months later and saying, I'm calling to update the information for someone who was passed six months ago. Hmm. That's the only downside <clears throat> of the program. But I can tell you that the good far outweighs the bad, but we have a it's one of the sh things that are assigned to one of the shift leaders, and they maintain those, and it's a perpetual update. So every six months, you'll receive a phone call to update the information. They do it right over the telephone and do the data entry, and then they'll have you dial 911 to make sure that it works because it keys in on 911. You noted the high turnover nationally of dispatchers. Are you experiencing the same kind of turnover? And if so, do you have difficulty getting qualified candidates? Right now, we have two positions open. We have over 225 applications for it. Mm -hmm. wow. And the way that we fill the process, and if we hire one person, if we hire two people, uh, one in three quarters will make it for us. And it's, it's a lengthy uh, process to go through the hiring. <clears throat> you know, it's not only the background and... Uh, we give you tests. Uh, you, you saw the, the picture of the five different computers. If you can operate one of those computers, you're perfect. Okay, then you operate this computer, you're perfect. Now you have to do them all simultaneously while you have somebody screaming in there, you know, at you in the ear. And, and then, you know, the stress level you'll deal with. We had a, we had a traumatic call today of, uh, at the Naval Weapons Station where a subject uh, ran into a bunch of Marines jogging. So our call volume was off the hook. Right after that call, and the, the dispatchers are still dealing with that and have the air ambulance launched and multiple agencies responding down there, right after that they get a call of somebody who's complaining about so-and-so's mailbox is too close. You know, and you wonder how they can make that switch without saying, you don't really have a problem, you know, so they have to deal with everything. So the, the stress adds into it as well. But we are under the national average. Two questions, Terry. First is, what is the cost sharing between us and your county and Williamsburg? 
Uh, the way that we had, we have entered, we entered a cost sharing agreement with y'all initially, and the cost sharing agreement that we put together, we have to have approved by our board any of the capital improvement funds. So if we're going to launch a new CAD system or we're going to launch a new radio system, we can't, we can't go to the city and say, by the way, your share is now going to be X. We have to go through your normal and <clears throat> our normal CIP processes. Uh, you're paying right now pretty much the same thing that you paid us when you launched. We haven't gone up. You just saw me do a presentation about several million dollars worth of technology that we've launched. And uh, there hasn't been a penny of it have been asked before by you because we've been able to do a lot of it through grants and through the normal operating budget with the dollars that we're collecting. You talk about a lot of training on your staff you know, up there in New York County. Does any of the training have to come down to the police and fire departments, like here in Pocoston in New York? Sure. I, have, fire? Uh, I myself have been out and, and done a lot of training on, on, the, <clears throat> on the radio system. Uh, my staff trains the uh, officers the and first firemen. responders okay. on uh, NCIC VSIN protocols and, and how to do all that. We handle all of that, uh, and it's, it's not for a fee. We handle and train anybody that needs to be trained. We either do it in the field, they come up to the office, and We've done some CERT training and, and a numerous training out here on an as-needed basis. You know, you call, we haul. <laughs> okay. I guess the third question was, early on you mentioned the cost for like a retina scan into a computer. Right. Was how much? Uh, it looks so like early day? indications are it's $150,000 because we have to put it on every device. And when I'm saying every device, every dispatcher screen is going to have to have it. Every field unit has to have it. Wow. The, the, the system that uh, Chief Bowen has down here that he can do it from his investigators, it has to have it. Every laptop in the car for anyone who's deployed in the field, they have to have it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an unfunded mandate, and it's another level of security that the federal government believes needs to be put in place. You mentioned three, three options there. Are you going with the retina? Which no. Well, I, it, we, we, I found out about that this week. The retina scan is a waste of money, in my opinion. That's a high-dollar one. Uh, and the reason is, if you go into our 911 center, you have four levels of security before you can get into where any of this stuff is. If you get in there, you really don't even need a password because you're supposed to be where you are. You're on cameras and four levels of security and so on. So for us, we're going to probably go with the cheapest, which would be a, some type of key fob, you know, a proximity reader. Cat card or something like that. We, yeah. you know. and, and there, you know, you spend three to five dollars for the device, but your your backroom equipment is the cost. And a key fob looks like it's going to be the best for everyone all the way around. You know, we're not keeping government secrets on here, and it's not you know FEMA or you know, Camp Perry or Langley Air Force Base. You know, we're running criminal histories and, and things like that that are sensitive, and they're not open to the public. But the security that we have now, we've, you know, find a piece of wood, we, we haven't been breached on. Thank you. But it's a technology world we live in. And as <laughs> I get older, you know, you go home and look at your children if you don't believe it's a technology. You know, I think I know a little bit and I go home and listen to my kids and they're like, hey, check out this new app I got on the iPhone. <laughs> so, yeah. And hackers, you know, are constantly trying to break in these systems. So our security... And there's a lot of money spent on our security, not only our backbone, our radio system. We've recently completed a, a uh, about a $15 million expansion on our radio system where we now enjoy coverage all the way up from mutual aid all the way up through Gloucester, Middlesex, Saluda, all the way up there. So we now have a very large radio system as well. From uh, the chief's perspective on the uh, governance board, <clears throat> Robert and I clearly understand that when we make decisions that could have financial impacts on the city, in terms of costs, that we have to be very careful about how we approach those. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, Chief Holloway and I consistently do is to go with Terry to the wireless board when he makes his presentations, and we have both testified in different venues uh, to get grant money. And most of everything which we've done and all the upgrades that have happened since uh, he and I have been the, the co-chiefs has been through grant money and uh, or leftover money from previous grants that was existing before we, we joined the center. So. Um, I've got to take, Gary takes full advantage of opportunities for other people's money. And, uh, and so we really haven't had to make a vote, to my knowledge, that had any financial impact on the city since 2007. And, uh, and York County has certainly has not come to us and done anything in 
in terms of suggesting to increase the amount we currently pay. So we've been, we've been very fortunate to have access to the level of and the quality of the radio system for what we paid to get in, to get in it. And I want to point out that any chain is as strong as its weakest link, and the team that's up here is pretty much unbreakable. <clears throat> We're doing, you know, Pocosin is being recognized at the national level. You know, uh, we have had presentations at the Senate and at the House that uh, Pocosin has been represented at the table, you know, in public safety and recognized by, you know, state senators and congressmen and uh, federal senators and such. And it's been, uh, it's been very rewarding, you know, to have these gentlemen sitting next to us as we're up trying to get legislation to give us more money for public safety and more broadband spectrum and so on. So, you know, everybody is having a hard time pronouncing Pocosin, but once they get it, they have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I came to your home back in, two, in 2007. It was very impressive. So it's, Thank you. Uh, it's quite an operation. Thank you. And it's all, anytime you all want to come up and take a look, we'll certainly facilitate a tour. And we are pushing the next generation. Uh, Terrace Terry mentioned I was very fortunate to go with him to D.C. And, and go to a Senate committee that's making decisions on this spectrum that's referred to in the papers as D-block. And, and the best way to describe it, it's just a, a segment of spectrum that's the highest quality that's out there. It's left. And once it's gone, it's gone. And so what we're trying to do is get that reserved for public, 10 megahertz of that, to get reserved for public safety. The federal government's given five. We want an additional five. So we can use that for broadband communication. And the best example I can give you is to take my iPhone, which cost $199, and tell you that this $5,000 radio doesn't come anywhere near the capabilities of this little phone. Mm -hmm. And so what they're going to do is taking broadband capabilities and put it into the radios that the officers and the firefighters carry. So eventually, the sending of the text messages, the sending of the pictures, the video will happen. And imagine the day when officers are on their way to a call for a bank robbery, and they're getting a live feed to their in-car computer from someone who's got a camera, and they're holding it out in their phone and videotaping it as the suspects are running out of the building. That's what's coming next. So uh, we've been working closely with the delegation from Virginia. Senator Warner supported our, our, our recommendation to, to vote it out of committee in trying to get that broadband reserved for public safety. And uh, York, Pocos, and Williamsburg 911 Center will be on the cutting edge of taking that technology and making it work before anybody else in the United States does. And you would have been proud to see <clears throat> Chief Bowen standing up in front of the Senate Commerce Committee with people like the police chief from the city of New York and San Jose, California, and Los Angeles, and San Diego, and so on. And here's Picosa. That's right. He's bigger than they were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, has learned, he has learned not to try to carry his gun in the sun. <laughs> that didn't work out too well. <laughs> Thanks again, Terry. We really appreciate your time. Randy, I guess uh, we get time to... Depends on how you want to spend the next 14 minutes. Okay. I would suggest to you that 14 minutes is probably insufficient to even begin the topic that you've got scheduled next. That's uh, what I'm thinking. So I'm not sure it would be efficient use of your time or, uh, or Ellen's time for that matter. So I would suggest you consider just a brief recess and come back at 7. I'm good with that. Help it, Council. Everybody good? Yeah. All right. So we'll move this to the next meeting as far as the uh, breeding of transportation projects within our city. And we appreciate everybody joining us. Thanks.